this is really, uh, I'm going to present a part of my um, PhD research. Um, my supervisors are Mike Morley and, and Bert Roberts, and, and my PhD is part of uh, Bert's project, uh, Out of Asia, looking at human evolution uh, in Asia during the Pleistocene, uh, human evolution and adaptation. And um, what uh, my PhD project is, is uh, I'm trying to understand the um, site formation processes that are active uh, within the uh, Pleistocene caves of Asia under these developing tropical uh, climates. So uh, these are uh, two pictures of ones of Liang Bo, the others of uh, Nia Cave. Um, Caves in Southeast Asia remain the primary resource for uh, prehistorians and quaternary researchers, despite the fact that um, apparently occupation is, is uh, generally less intensive within those environments. And that's because the caves you know, obviously mitigate the uh, weathering processes that uh, remove archaeological material in the wider landscape. Um, Despite that, they contain, uh, you know, very uh, complex records with um, uh, difficult to disentangle uh, depositional and post-depositional histories. Um, one of the um, main uh, factors affecting preservation is, is guano. Um, guano is uh, the, the droppings of bats in, in this case, but can also refer to birds. Um, it generally indicates periods of anthropogenic abandonment because, you know, bats don't really like to live around humans. Um, in, in the tropics, it forms profiles, you know, meters deep, and uh, within these, um, you know, surrounding them, preservation conditions can vary greatly. Um, these guano profiles can provide uh, records of biomarkers and isotopic signals of uh, environmental changes in the wider landscape, particularly vegetation changes as bats act as uh, gathering and, and averaging agents of these environmental signals. But um, what is uh, discussed in the existing literature quite a lot is how as, as guano decomposes in uh, aerobic environments, you, you get this uh, uh, these acidic leachates and, and with the combination of that and the high phosphate content uh, results in really substantially uh, severe diagenesis of archaeological deposits. Um, this is one of the sites that I'm working on uh, for my PhD. This is Kong Mong Cave in, in North Vietnam. Um, regionally, it's, it's quite an important site for terminal Pleistocene and Holocene, um, hunter-gatherers and the transition to farming. Um, recent excavations have discovered some uh, earlier sediments. So this goes um, into the kind of upper Pleistocene. Uh, you'll, you'll see there's, there's a lot of slumping, a lot of deformation, a lot of nodule formation you know this is a huge erosive contact there's anthropogenic material throughout so these are really um pretty difficult to interpret layers and there's obviously been a lot of post-depositional change and um, with reference to the existing literature um i haven't found it particularly easy to um in, in interpret these um, so geoarchaeological approaches to, to cave sediment interpretation obviously require, you know, combining um, different uh, different sediment characterizations, different uh, elements of soil science. But the problem is that um, the site formation processes in general in, in tropical climates are poorly constrained and there's not much um, reference data. Um, it, it just doesn't have the same history of um, research as uh, sites in higher latitudes. So this somewhat perverse experiment is designed to generate some reference data um, related to that. So the experimental setup um, what I have done is created these uh, occupation surfaces, if you will. Um, this little <laughs> box with sand, uh, you've got some bone, some fish bone, clay aggregates, uh, charcoal, bamboo and carbonate rock. Um, this is then topped up with guano and uh, waterlogged. And, oh, it gets worse, um, you know, honestly. Uh, <laughs> So there's, uh, there, there's really quite a number of them, and uh, they, they're excavated uh, one per month um, over, over the course of two years to see how um, 
diagenesis pro, um, progresses in, in the, these waterlogged um, anoxic guano deposits that I s suspected were happening from uh, the, the features that I've observed. And there's also a series of controls there. Um, obviously, you can't get guano from B&Q. So we had to go, well, we were, we were privileged enough to go to New South Wales's uh, largest insectivorous bat colony because insectivorous bats uh, <laughs> produce the, the, a more uh, acidic guano. And these are, um, these are Eastern horseshoe uh, micro bats um, and, and they're quite common across uh, Southeast Asia. So that was quite appropriate. Um, there were 30,000 bats within this uh, small cave um, with just really eye-watering concentrations of ammonia inside it. Um, they're not the only things that like this environment. This is a lace monitor um, who is eyeing up some baby bats that have fallen into the guano. So um, this is an indication of you know the, the complex food webs that exist in, in this environment and, and some of the, you know, other than geochemical processes that are going on, they're, they're really very complex environments. Uh, this is the bat cave <laughs> in the laboratory, um, which which I've in inflicted upon my my poor colleagues. Uh, it's it's um, it, it has a blast radius. Um, so uh, alongside the uh, the waterlogged uh, guano samples, there there are a number of controls looking at variables such as moisture. So I've got some some dry ones, uh, some other saturated ones. Some are kept in the oven, um, some are kept at room temperature. They wouldn't let me keep one in the tea room fridge. So um, <laughs> additionally, we've got ones that are buried in guano, uh, ones that are buried in sand and, and, and ones that have been exposed. Um, and uh, yeah, so as these are excavated one per month, uh, what, one uh, thing we do is uh, look at the sedimentary environment. So we look at variables, you know, typical in, in variables that you would look at, pH, electroconductivity, redox potential, you know, visual inspection under the microscope. Sorry, I should have explained. The reason there were two lines of uh, two kind of arranged columns of uh, archaeological analogues is so that one half can be excavated and the other half can be dried and made into a thin section for further analyses. Um, and uh, yeah, we use a combination of uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, uh, X-ray techniques, and, and uh, loss and ignition to look at how this sedimentary environment is changing. Um, assessing assemblage taphonomy, uh, we have uh, we've got an FTIR microscope, we've got a separate uh, ATR FTIR, and we've also got a Raman microscope, and. Um, we are uh, going to use uh, scanning electron microscopy and, and backscattering to look at the um, diagenesis of the bone in particular. So this experiment is in its initial stages, but I'll show you some of the initial um, results. Um, so that's what they look like as you excavate them. Um, obviously, as expected, it's an anoxic environment. It's you know analogous to a hydric soil very reducing conditions um, there's the anaerobic respiration uh, the, the smell of the guano has changed very much so it's it's went from a, a kind of acrid ammonia smell to you know a real um, fecal kind of smell and that's obviously <laughs> uh, the uh, re reduction you've got hydrogen sulfide replacing uh, and, and methanes and that sort of thing um, and yeah high, high pH um, so this is the bone in its unaltered state. Uh, you can see it's a, it's a relatively smooth surface and it's got the exterior lamella. Um, there's another shot of another kind of unaltered bone. Um, that's it after one month. You can see the surface is much more rough and uh, it, it's, it's quite diagenetically altered already. The, the, as we move on, the exterior, this is three months, the exterior lamella is gone and you, you can see these voids. Um, so this is, um, we can use FTIR to look at the relative concentrations of uh, collagen and, and phosphate mineral. This is from the, the FTIR microscope on the outside and essentially uh, 
the mineral to um, collagen ratio is assessed by the area under this pick, which is the uh, phosphate, and the area under this one, uh, amide one, which is representative of the collagen. Um, af after one month from the just external, um, the external FTIR microscope analysis, the um, amide one is, is virtually non-existent. We can also see a slight shift in this, which indicates some sort of mineralogical change um, but the, the FTIR microscope isn't very useful for looking at minerals because it's got a restricted range. Um, when we uh, take powdered samples on, on the other FTIR machine, uh, we can examine these pigs. And the ratio of uh, heights of these pigs um, can, can indicate um, mineral changes in increasing order, uh, increasing crystallinity in the um, mineral fraction. Um, and you can see, essentially, while this gives us much more um, range and, and much better data in, in that sense, it's, it's not very spatially resolved and the sampling isn't great uh, because we're having to you know, crush off parts of the bone and it, it's, um, it's not fantastic. Um, we've got a, a tentative correlation using that between uh, decreasing um, collagen in the outer layer and, and increasing crystallinity as the, the phosphate minerals reorder, but um, it's, it's not very well spatially resolved. Um, this is uh, some images of uh, cut sections through the bone, just, just cut with a saw. Um, you can see in, there's some variety in the patterns of alteration. Um, in this one month one, the um, micro, microbial action is um, proceeding in from the outside, and it's also proceeding in um, here from the marrow section. Um, in, in the two months, uh, it, it seems that the microbial decay is um, possibly arranged along uh, some of the bone, sorry I shouldn't stand in front of that, some of the uh, structural features of the bone. Um, and, and here you can see some other changes. What we're hoping to do is uh, use the um, Raman spectroscopy uh, in combination with um, backscattering from uh, SEM backscattering analysis of the thin sections to really get a much better understanding of how these um, bioerosion, uh, diagenetic uh, changes are, are progressing um, just as, uh, as well as the bone. This is a piece of carbonate gravel, which was, you know, just, just a, a piece of white limestone when it went in. This is after um, three months. You can see a clear line um, from where it was buried in the sand and the upper um, section of it, which was sticking into uh, the guano. Um, so, uh, and there you can see there's kind of sand uh, welded into these um, oxides which have been precipitated uh, onto it in that time. So I was quite surprised that that, that progressed that quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've got some, some Raman results, you know, that's, that's carbonates and then that's, that's hematite from the kind of wet welded area. Um, so some initial conclusions, um, it's, it's really in, in its very initial stages, this work, but um, yeah, as you would expect, very reducing basic environments develop uh, rapidly on, under these experimental conditions. Um, Despite the pH not lowering as it would in oxid conditions, diagenesis of, of bone in, in these environments proceeds rapidly, uh, and, and that's initially through this microbial um, bioerosion, um, and reduxomorphic features form with, within a matter of months. Um, so some further work, uh, yeah, we'll move on. Uh, continue to uh, use vibrational spectroscopy to get a better understanding of what's going on, uh, especially as I'm not on fieldwork now. Um, statistical analysis of these uh, results, you know, when we can do these measures of crystallinity or, or measures of um, 
the various fractions decomposing, and uh, then moving on to histological analysis using um, the, the prepared thin sections and scanning electron microscopy. And um, I think one of the most interesting parts of this will be the comparisons between the various samples that have been buried in, in different conditions and mediums to get some sort of idea of how um, the simulated tropical conditions have a, uh, an effect on um, assemblage to follow me. Okay, and, and that's me.